On estime que le blanchiment d'argent représente chaque année entre 2 et 5% du PIB mondial. 2% du PIB mondial équivaut à la richesse créée par la Turquie, les Philippines, le Bangladesh, le Sri Lanka et le Pakistan réunis. Tous les ans, plus de 500 milliards de dollars s'évadent des pays en développement pour atterrir dans les économies occidentales, principalement par l'intermédiaire de structures offshore. En 1952, le futur président du Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, est emprisonné par les autorités coloniales britanniques. Il deviendra le symbole du combat pour l'indépendance du Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta is viewed as as Kenya's father of independence so to speak. He used to go by the name Johnstone Kamau. He used to be a water meter reader in uh, the colonial government's municipal council. He was also fairly well spoken. Um, I believe that's part of the reason why he was selected from amongst the political intelligentsia at the time. À sa sortie de prison, le presque sans un sou Kenyatta devient un ami proche du dernier gouverneur britannique du Kenya, Malcolm MacDonald. En 1963, Kenyatta accède par les urnes au poste de premier ministre du Kenya nouvellement indépendant. Il en deviendra peu de temps après le président. Quant à Malcolm MacDonald, il est nommé au commissaire britannique. Le gouvernement et la fonction publique de ce nouveau pays sont composés principalement de loyalistes. C'est ainsi que les Britanniques les nommaient. Après l'indépendance, la Grande-Bretagne conserve un certain nombre de sites militaires au Kenya. Encore aujourd'hui, la Grande-Bretagne forme chaque année six bataillons d'infanterie dans ce pays. 60 ans après l'indépendance, la famille Kenyatta est l'une des plus riches du Kenya. The Kenyatta family have vast investments in land um, across the country right down to the coast all the way up to the to the what was called the white highlands they own the biggest milk company in in kenya they own one of kenya's biggest banks they have a chain of hotels they're building a sub city right now out just right outside the um the bounds of uh, of nairobi city There's always been an open question about how Jomo Kenyatta was able to become such a rich person. Um, just, you know, one or two years after becoming president. His salary at the time doesn't match the kind of wealth that he has. There have been memoirs written by, you know, people from his administration that say that he essentially would, you know, engage in land grabs. Um, of very, very prime pieces of land owned by members of the settler community, etc. Un rapport déclassifié de la CIA indique que les fonds fournis par des gouvernements étrangers destinés à racheter les terres aux colons pour les donner aux populations autochtones ne possédant pas de terres auraient été captés par la famille Kenyatta et son entourage afin d'acquérir ces terres pour eux-mêmes. Aujourd'hui, la famille Kenyatta est la plus grande propriétaire foncière du Kenya avec plus de 200 millions d'hectares de terres de premier choix partout dans le pays, tandis que nombreux sont les premiers combattants pour la liberté à n'avoir rien reçu alors même qu'ils se sont battus pour la restitution de leurs terres. Jomo Kenyatta est décédé en 1978. Son fils, Uhuru Kenyatta, a suivi les traces de son père en politique. Le pays président Uhuru Kenyatta était parmi les pays riches qui ont été nommés cette semaine dans les papiers de Pandora. Papers. According to the Pandora Papers, Kenya's president Uhuru Kenyatta and six members of his family have been linked to 13 offshore companies. And what was revealed is that the family had invested in, in um, offshore um, structures. For if you're including the, the extended family as early as the mid-70s. Uhuru Kenyatta was listed as a beneficiary of a trust that, so to speak, belonged to his mother upon her death. Uhuru Kenyatta s'est présenté comme étant un défenseur de la transparence, prétendant que la lutte contre la corruption était au centre de son programme. This dragon, this beast called corruption, is an animal that we intend to slay. President Uhuru Kenyatta welcomed the leakage of the Pandora Papers, saying the publication of the papers will go a very long way in enhancing the financial transparency and openness required in the country and around the globe. Au Kenya, les deux tiers de la population vit avec moins de 3,2 dollars par jour. 
70% des familles kenyanes vivent dans un état de vulnérabilité chronique à cause de la malnutrition, de l'insécurité alimentaire et de certaines maladies faute de prévention. La loi kenyane impose au président qu'il communique une fois par an la liste de ses intérêts financiers au ministère des Finances. les Kenyatas sont ce que l'on appelle des personnes politiquement exposées, PPE. Une personne politiquement exposée est une personne exerçant une fonction pour le bien public. Il y a donc un risque plus élevé qu'elle soit impliquée dans des affaires de pot de vin ou de corruption. Politically exposed persons, in theory, have access, or potential access, to public funds uh, within particular countries. And our investigations have come up with lots of evidence that, unfortunately, there are peps who have been stealing public funds and moving it into places like the UK, either to hide it, to clean it, or to spend it. So peps are incredibly significant when it comes to the money laundering picture. And that's why Uh, professionals in the regulated sector, in the private sector, are supposed to do enhanced due diligence whenever they have a client who is a politically exposed person. Unfortunately, there are multiple cases that we have found where that clearly hasn't happened. I, I could think of one, uh, you know, former political official who was accused of embezzling a lot of money. This was splashed all over the internet. Uh, within the five years following that, this person was able to open several UK bank accounts, took out a few mortgages on UK houses, opened um, a UK company. Can you share who that person was? Because of slap suits in the UK, which I'm sure you're really aware of, we're very aware of them, unfortunately. Um, I have to like literally libel check everything I say, learn it like a script and then say it, so I can't. Even if that is already in the public domain? Yeah. It's a, it's a big issue. Journalists like yourselves, NGOs like us, are often targeted by very expensive lawyers in London, <laughs> unfortunately, who take on dubious clients uh, and basically pursue, pursue, pursue NGOs, pursue journalists for daring to mention the corrupt dealings of, of these people. La dynastie des Kenyatta n'est pas la seule dans les pays en développement ayant amassé des richesses et des terres au-delà de leurs sources de revenus. Depuis leur arrivée au pouvoir juste après la chute du régime soviétique, la famille Aliyev en Azerbaïdjan a accumulé une très grande fortune et un véritable empire commercial. L'Azerbaïdjan est l'un des plus importants producteurs de pétrole brut et de gaz naturel. Les énergies fossiles sont tellement abondantes dans ce territoire que les gisements de surface brûlent depuis des siècles par endroits. Le Royaume-Uni est le premier investisseur étranger en Azerbaïdjan, représentant à lui seul plus de la moitié de l'ensemble des investissements étrangers. The Aliyev family is the richest family in Azerbaijan. They came to power in 1993 when Heydar Aliyev, a former KGB general and secretary general of Azerbaijan Soviet Republic, orchestrated a coup. En 1993, Heydar Aliyev s'est emparé du pouvoir par un coup d'État. Peu avant sa mort, son fils, Ilham Aliyev, a pris la suite de son père. Depuis, il a été sans interruption et est encore à la tête de son pays. BP s'est implanté en Azerbaïdjan en 1992 et, après le coup d'État, 
BP a signé un accord secret avec le nouveau président. Aujourd'hui, BP est la plus grande compagnie pétrolière étrangère en Azerbaïdjan. La politique opposition a toujours dit que le British Petroleum était responsable pour le état de coup. Ils ont brought Haider Aliyev au pouvoir. Je me souviens en 1993, pendant cette période difficile électorale et coup, les compagnies de sécurité privée britanniques faisaient quelque chose en Azerbaïdjan. Peut-être qu'ils venaient pour protéger quelqu'un de haut niveau officiel du Britain Petroleum. Ou peut-être qu'ils venaient pour aider les membres de la famille de Zaliyev. Nous ne savons pas. Personne ne sait ce qui est dans ce contrat entre le Britain Petroleum et Zaliyev. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état secret en Azerbaïdjan. C'est comme le plus grand état la famille Aliyev a d'énormes intérêts commerciaux en Azerbaïdjan. Qui est l'honneur des cinq plus grandes banques commerciales en Azerbaïdjan C'est la famille Aliyev. Qui est l'honneur des plus grandes compagnies de transport privées C'est la famille Aliyev. Qui est l'honneur des plus grandes hôtels de 5 étoiles en Azerbaïdjan De nouveau, c'est la famille Aliyev. Ils ont privatisé les banques plus grandes banques et après qu'ils ont fait l'honneur de ces banques, They start using these banks to launder money. Heads of state and other major figures have deposited vast assets offshore. It's according to a review of nearly 12 million files from around the world. It's the latest report by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The Pandora Papers expose a London property empire worth nearly $700 million amassed by the ruling family of Azerbaijan. So one of the properties that we looked at was on uh, Conduit Street in central London. This property was bought in 2009 by a company owned by one of the associates of the presidency of Azerbaijan. And then this property was basically sold shortly after that to the daughter who was 19 at the time. Um, Arzu Alieva, and eventually it was sold to the Crown Estate, um, which is, you know, owned by Queen Elizabeth II. La famille Aliyev en a tiré un profit de 31 millions de livres sterling. There was another property in Mayfair, Maddox Street, which was transferred to um, Haider Aliyev, who was the 11-year-old son of the President of Azerbaijan. So, you know, overnight, um, the the tenants started paying their their rent to an 11-year-old. Boy. In Kensington, there was a cluster of properties in one development called Thornwood Gardens. Over here in Hoburn, there was a, um, a hotel. Quand le journal italien La Repubblica interrogea Ilham Aliyev au sujet des révélations des Pandora Papers, il répondit :« Certaines forces en Occident tentent d'utiliser ce genre d'insinuation ou de demi-vérité afin de discréditer l'image de l'Azerbaïdjan et de compromettre sa position. » Ils cherchent à nous accuser, à nous subordonner et à nous imposer leur volonté. Et moi, je dis non. Je défendrai l'Azerbaïdjan, sa souveraineté, son indépendance, ses choix jusqu'à la fin de ma vie. Toutes ces sales histoires ne signifient rien pour moi et pour le peuple d'Azerbaïdjan. In the Pandora Papers, We saw dozens of politicians and world leaders, current and former world leaders, with wealth offshore. Offshore service providers are supposed to uh, conduct enhanced due diligence and really scrutinize the sources of wealth of the politically connected people that they provide services to. Les Pandora Papers ont révélé que les organismes financiers offshore n'ont pas appliqué les mesures appropriées aux clients politiquement exposés. You know, there was some light googling, running names through risk databases and things like that. The people conducting these checks are really doing um, checks to be seen to be doing checks. At the moment, it's very hard to pursue large banks and big firms for money laundering offences because we do not have a failure to prevent money laundering offence within UK law, which Transparency International very much believes we should have. Our research identified 582 UK individuals and firms who were involved in major money laundering cases. They have people who will uh, turn a blind eye uh, to any, anything they may discover, proceed anyway, and those who maybe don't do enhanced due diligence when they should. You will find individuals and firms 
they will actually deliberately go out to try and get the services uh, of those who are potentially involved in uh, corruption and criminality because it's, it's big business, it's big money. There are 84,000 UK properties that are owned anonymously. Uh, now, of course, some of those will be owned with the legitimate money, but it, it's quite possible that a lot will be owned with suspicious funds. Bakou, la capitale de l'Azerbaïdjan, est un lieu très inhabituel. Et ce, pas uniquement à cause de son fort taux de Chahiran, car le taux de policiers et d'officiers de sécurité est encore plus important. On rencontre un officier de sécurité à chaque coin de rue, même sous les ponts. On trouve des parcs ornés de marbre et de grès partout dans le centre-ville. C'est seulement dans les zones périphériques que l'on sort du conte de fées pour être ramené à la réalité. In 2005, Azerbaijan signed the UN Convention Against Corruption. One of the requirements of that treaty was to implement financial declaration for all state officials. Parliament ratified that treaty. Yet, until today, 17 years later, nobody is declaring their wealth. The first journalist who exposed the huge corruption in the government was killed at the front door of his house. After that, we saw that all journalists who spoke about stolen assets, they have a problem. They are put in jail. Their lives become extremely difficult. They are prosecuted. They are blackmailed with private family issues. L'Agence Nationale de Lutte contre la Criminalité, ANC, a pour rôle d'enquêter sur le blanchiment d'argent au Royaume-Uni. I think there are reasonable grounds for the NCA to investigate assets owned by or linked to the Aliyev family in the UK. It's not always entirely clear how the presidential family has made their wealth. Um, some of that money, at least, came through money laundering systems, laundromats, which are known to have funneled illicit money out of Azerbaijan. Nous avons souhaité demander à l'ANC pourquoi elle n'a pas ouvert une enquête au sujet des actifs détenus au Royaume-Uni par la famille Aliyev. L'ANC a refusé de nous parler. When I was in Azerbaijan, the British embassy occasionally invited us for breakfast with ambassador and other British officials. They would tell us that they were afraid that if we did a strong investigation, we would put ourselves in trouble. They never give us any support to investigate corruption. British politicians, including British politicians in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, try to wash the negative image of Aliyev. You know who is the biggest lobbyist in Azerbaijan from the UK? It's the son of the Queen, Prince Andrew, Epstein's friend. He is also a friend of Aliyev, a very good friend. Tous les cinq ans, le peuple d'Azerbaïdjan élit son président. Et tous les cinq ans, depuis 1993, M. Aliyev est systématiquement réélu. Lors des élections de 2008, M. Aliyev a obtenu 89% des voix. En 2013, il en a obtenu 84,5% et en 2018, il a obtenu 86% des voix. Pendant les élections de 2018, Emin Hussainov travaillait pour une ONG enquêtant sur la fraude électorale. We observed the elections and discovered irregularities. After that, the government closed down our NGO. They confiscated all our equipment. They put most of us in jail. I decided to escape. The police in Azerbaijan were looking for me as if I was the number one terrorist in the country. They put my photo at the entrance of all metro stations. The taxi drivers and the bus drivers had my photo. I changed my appearance. I grew a beard and dyed my hair blonde. Secret agents were waiting in front of the Swiss embassy. They asked the guard, have you checked him? And the guard replied, this is not the guy you are looking for. The guy is a foreigner. Switzerland protect me. And after 10 months, The head of the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs came to Azerbaijan and he was able to take me with him to Switzerland. After that, 
President Alif illegally canceled my passport and he stripped me of my citizenship. La passion de la famille Aliyev pour les propriétés londoniennes et le recours à des sociétés offshore pour cacher leur fortune se reflète au sein d'une autre dynastie politique dans les pays en développement, la famille Sharif au Pakistan. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has been disqualified from office. The court also disqualified the country's finance minister Ishaq Dar. This uh, verdict was unanimous. All the five judges declared that Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is not an honest and sagacious person and hence he should be disqualified. Nawaz Sharif a été élu premier ministre à trois reprises. Au cours de son mandat dans les années 90, Nawaz Sharif a privatisé de nombreuses industries d'État. The privatization policies which were initiated by uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif during his stint as prime minister during the 90s That is the start of corruption where a lot of uh, state holdings they were portrayed as if they are making losses and then they were handed out to different uh, political backers of Nawaz Sharif, his friends and uh, his business associates. Le gouvernement de Nawaz Sharif a ensuite fait adopter une loi empêchant les contrôleurs fiscaux de se renseigner sur l'origine des fonds en provenance de l'étranger investis au Pakistan. One thing which we need to remember and this is very very important when you're in the power you can make laws according to your will you can actually manipulate the system you can tell you can bribe the people you can get cuts from wherever you want and this is what the sheriffs has been doing and this is what they've been accused over the years it's a close knit family affair in the case of Hudaybiya paper mill once you look at the directors and shareholders it's only the entire sharif family uh, the immediate blood relations and a few cousins who are also mentioned as directors. To look at uh, the shareholding of Ramzan Sugar Mill, that gives you an idea that it is uh, run by Chief Executive Officer Mr. Hamza Shabash Sharif. Shabash Sharif est le frère cadet de Nawaz Sharif. Il était le président de l'Assemblée du Punjab, tandis que son frère était Premier ministre. Il est accusé d'avoir blanchi des dizaines de millions de dollars par l'intermédiaire de la société Sugar Mill, détenue par la famille Sharif. Accounts were opened in the name of these low-level, low-wage employees who do not come into the tax net. Money used to be deposited in those accounts and finally they used to land in the accounts of either Mr. Hamza Shahbaz Sharif, Mr. Suleiman Shahbaz Sharif or Mr. Shahbaz Sharif himself. In fact, uh, these files which you see here, it gives the names, it gives the banking do documents, the chalans, everything which is mentioned in these, uh, all the banking records. The names of the low-wage employees. Here is uh, one example, look at it. Mr. Masrood Anwar, he is depositing uh, this in the name of uh, Mr. Shehbaz Sharif. This is 1.6 million rupees. This was deposited in Habib Bank of Pakistan on 26th, 27th April 2017 when Shehbaz Sharif was the chief minister. This is another uh, deposit, 13th May 2016, in the name of uh, Mia Muhammad Shabazz Sharif, an amount of uh, 6,52,451 rupees deposited in an account by Mr. Masrood Anwar. One crore and uh, 90 lakh rupees being deposited in the account of Mr. Shabazz Sharif by Masrood Anwar. Now, you, you might ask, uh, who is Masrood Anwar? Masrur Anwar, according to this investigation uh, uh, by the Federal Investigation Agency, was uh, a low-level employee of uh, Sharif family. Your own family member is the finance minister and uh, your other brother is the prime minister. So then entire banking chain was there to facilitate them. And I was talking to one of the sources in the investigation uh, because once they investigated the bankers as to how it was happening under their nose and why they uh, didn't stop all these activities, they said that people used to come with uh, gunmen uh, into the banks. And one of the females, the investigator said she was crying uh, a banking official that uh, what we could have done. The bank managers, they used to get a call uh, from uh, top, uh, top executives in the bank 
the banks themselves were part of this nexus of covering covering up the corruption of the Sharif family. The so-called Panama Papers contain allegations of money laundering and tax evasion. Involving world leaders and where some of them are accused of hiding their money in many cases in an effort to avoid taxes. It was a surprise for uh, the people in Pakistan because it came out internationally. It had much more credibility because previously over the years, the Sharif family had been using the news uh, that all these allegations against them are politically motivated. Sharif's three children are named in the Panama Papers. His family owns properties in London through offshore accounts. Sharif's daughter denies owning the London properties. Documents from her allegedly date back to 2006 and show she is a trustee of the properties, not an owner. But those documents are written in a font called Calibri, which was not commercially available until 2007. If you look at 1992 and 93, this is a very important time. Mariam Essers grew 21 times, and there's no justification for that. In a single year, you are not a business owner. There's no business under your name, but 21 times your assets are going up. En 1992, Mariam Nawaz a fêté ses 19 ans. Après les révélations des Panama Papers, les agences d'investigation pakistanaises ont enquêté sur la situation financière de la famille Sharif. The joint investigation team basically found out that uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif uh, could not justify uh, the assets he had made uh, from known sources of income. That was one of the main charges. The matter was sent for criminal prosecution. In criminal prosecution, there was a trial which went on for almost a year. And in that trial, not even a single answer came from Mr. Sharif about the origin of his wealth or the explanation of those four Avonfield flats in London. Where is the money trail? That they have never been able to prove. La famille Sharif est considérée comme l'une des plus riches du Pakistan, mais l'origine de leur richesse reste un mystère. The flat that you're living in at the moment, in, in Mayfair, was actually named in the Pakistani paper, The News, last year as one of four which was illegally bought by your father through various Swiss and offshore companies. Why don't people who, is, who are actually blaming us for that go to the court and prove it? But do you know who owns the flat that you're living in? Well, that is not the question right now. Why not? But it's the question I'm asking you. Do you know who owns the flat? Well. It's on a rent. It's, I'm, I'm living on a rent basis which comes from every, every uh, quarter from Pakistan. You're and renting it personally or the money comes from Pakistan? The money comes from Pakistan. I'm just like any other student living with his parents. I doesn't necessarily have to know about what the facts and what, who owns the flat and who pays for um, the rent and who pays for my living. The family deserves all this. It is not my fault that I was born in a rich family, in a wealthy family. My grandfather earned that with the hard, hard work, sheer hard work. When you ask them that where you got this money from, they will start telling you the story of their late grandfather. At the time of independence, we came from India, we have businesses. Uh, seriously speaking, there's no business in the world which has no money trail. Uh, if you look at their tax filings, it doesn't come out as a big industrial family. The Sharifs uh, never featured in that uh, rich families of Pakistan. But uh, now if you make a list of the richest families in Pakistan, then definitely Sharifs uh, would feature in the top 10, maybe in the top five, because exact uh, amount of their holdings uh, as to how much is uh, hidden in uh, Luxembourg, in UK, in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, what is in different bank accounts uh, in the United States, uh, that is not known. Whether it is $4 billion or $5 billion, that is not known. En décembre 2018, à la suite de la publication des Panama Papers, Nawaz Sharif et sa fille ont été condamnés à 7 ans de prison pour des faits de corruption. Nawaz Sharif a été libéré sous caution pour recevoir des soins médicaux à Londres. Il refuse à présent de retourner au Pakistan. Depuis Londres, Nawaz Sharif prétend être l'objet d'un complot orchestré par l'armée pakistanaise. Bijli 
जवाब आपको देना होगा दवाई ना मिलने से दवाई ना मिलने से मेरे पाकिस्तान का गरीब पड़ रहा है बाजवा साहब जवाब आपको देना होगा गरीब की रोटी दस रुपए की हो गई है बाजवा साहब जवाब आपको देना होगा और जनरल फैज जनरल फैज ये सब कुछ आपके हाथों से हुआ है जवाब भी आपको देना होगा आपने आपने नवाज शरीफ को बागी कहना है जरूर कहिए गद्दार कहना है जरूर कहिए इश्तिहारी कहना है जरूर कहिए हाई जैकर कहना है जरूर कहिए लेकिन नवाज शरीफ अपने गरीब और मजलूम आवाज की आवाज बनता रहेगा Nous avons contacté Priti Patel, ministre de l'Intérieur, pour lui demander pourquoi Nawaz Sharif, qui avait dépassé de deux ans la durée de validité de son visa, n'avait pas été expulsé de Grande-Bretagne. Priti Patel s'est empressée d'expulser les demandeurs d'asile lorsqu'elle était au ministère de l'Intérieur, mais elle n'a pris aucune mesure à l'encontre de Nawaz Sharif. Priti Patel et le ministère de l'Intérieur n'ont pas souhaité donner une interview. Nous avons également contacté l'Agence nationale de lutte contre la criminalité (ANC). Nous voulions comprendre pourquoi il n'y avait pas eu d'enquête sérieuse concernant les actifs détenus par Nawaz Sharif. L'ANC n'a pas accepté de nous parler. Nawaz Sharif n'est pas le seul membre de la famille Sharif à avoir élu domicile à Londres. London is the second home of House of Sharif. Hassan Nawaz is here, Hussein Nawaz is here, Hussein's children, Zikriya and another son is here, right? Hassan's children are here. Uh, Nawaz Sharif is here. And then, if you look at uh, Ali Dar, who is uh, the son-in-law of Nawaz Sharif, Asma Nawaz Sharif, who is the youngest daughter of Nawaz Sharif, she's here. Uh, Ishaq Dar is here. Then Shabazz Sharif family is here as well. Uh, Suleiman Shabazz is here. Ali Imran, who is actually the son-in-law of Shabazz Sharif, he also lives in this country. Uh, Shabazz Sharif's daughter Rabia Imran is also in this country. And she is actually on a run and wanted in Pakistan. Ali Imran is wanted in Pakistan. Ishaq Dar is wanted in Pakistan. All these people are wanted in Pakistan. Sitting in Pakistan in third world country, you look at it as to why most of the people who are wanted uh, by the courts in Pakistan, by the law in Pakistan, they find a refuge in uh, London, UK. It doesn't make sense to me. Londres est la destination de choix pour les personnes politiquement exposées ayant accumulé de grandes fortunes au-delà de leurs sources de revenus officielles ainsi que les membres de leur famille. Ces fortunes sont souvent blanchies ou transférées à l'étranger grâce à des juridictions dépendantes du Royaume-Uni. Leur provenance et leur appartenance sont occultées avant d'être réinvesties dans l'économie mondiale. La fuite des capitaux est une préoccupation majeure pour les pays en développement. We know that there is a huge uh, capital flight, and it's not just specific to our time period. It has been historical. It directly impacts the economy because you see the issue is that if our currency is not doing well, and we have a serious issue of uh, sustaining the value of Pakistani rupee, that has a correlation with capital flight. Le groupe d'action financière internationale, ou GAFI, est un organisme intergouvernemental de lutte contre le blanchiment d'argent et le terrorisme, dont le siège est à Paris. Il a inscrit le Pakistan sur sa liste grise. Our financial systems have been made more accessible. Um, we have sharing of information with almost everyone. Um, we are pursuing many money laundering cases. Uh, as far as we can pursue because of course the the missing element still is the cooperation from the other jurisdictions that is not forthcoming and sometimes we wonder that we are in gray list but the money that has been taken from here is in countries which are not in the gray list so that is something that you know sometimes is like okay so why are we in the gray list then? Nous avons contacté le GAFI pour une interview qu'il a poliment déclinée. 
Nous aurions aimé demander au GAFI comment est-il possible pour le Royaume-Uni, la Suisse et le Luxembourg de faire partie des pays hors de tout soupçon, alors que ces trois pays sont connus pour être les plus grands foyers du blanchiment d'argent, à travers lesquels des milliards de dollars d'argent sale sont réinvestis tous les ans. The money is stolen here and it is hidden in the developed countries, in the developed world. If that is happening, it's not just the fault of Pakistani system that the money is able to go out. What I question is the, uh, the double standards. So for example, if you ask on one side from countries like Pakistan to have more checks and be more open, we expect in return the same from other countries when we are investigating someone. We will write a mutual legal assistance request to, let's say, Switzerland. And we will say that we have information that Mr. A has a bank account in Switzerland in such and such bank. We don't know the branch. We don't know the account number. But he's definitely in the system and his identity, date of birth, everything is shared and we will seek information. And maybe one year or two years after, we will receive certain questions from saying, Uh, can you identify the branch name or can you give us the account number? <laughs> Whereas we have said in our first request, we don't have those. When Pakistan Tariq and Saf government came into power, we, uh, we formed an informal arrangement with the UK authorities called Justice and Accountability Initiative. And uh, NCA also set up a small anti-corruption unit Within NCA, which was to assist in Pakistan on its request. Le ministère de l'Intérieur et l'ANC, l'Agence nationale britannique de lutte contre les criminalités, sont chargés de traiter les demandes d'entraide judiciaire émanant d'États étrangers. Le Pakistan a déposé de nombreuses demandes auprès de cette institution en relation avec les actifs détenus par la famille Sharif à Londres. The request on Sharif families are uh, taking a lot of time. It's taking way too long to take uh, some simple actions like, for example, freezing of assets or investigating the assets or the activities in the UK when people are, you know, uh, facing charges or convicted of serious crime in Pakistan. Pakistan did its part. We did our investigation. We did our inquiry. Uh, but has there been any investigation on British side? We don't know. What about the Mayfair, Mayfair Flats? What about the whole property portfolio of Hassan Nawaz that has come in Panama Papers? The impression that goes to people is that everyone who uh, commits such crimes or who is involved in corruption ends up in London, living in Mayfair Flats. The main issues for developing countries uh, are Western countries, unfortunately. Uh, here in the UK and other Western countries, we can be very good at pointing the finger elsewhere and saying, hey, look at all that corruption over there. But the reality is uh, we are facilitating that corruption. We are complicit uh, in the laundering of public funds because we have a ready-made system, ready to go, uh, where corrupt individuals can hide can spend, uh, can clean their money. London and its role in the offshore world is that it's a money launderer's paradise. It's a money launderer's paradise uh, or haven. You know, it's, it's a place where if you want to stash um, illicitly uh, earned wealth, you can do so anonymously um, and you can do so with relatively few checks and balances. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has launched a major military operation against Ukraine. Thousands of troops backed by tanks and missile fire have crossed the border into Ukraine on every front. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky called on all of its citizens who were ready to defend the country from Russian forces to come forward, saying Kyiv would issue weapons to everyone who wants them. We've already put in place the largest package of sanctions in our history. Today, the White House announced new sanctions against members of the Russian elite. Tying Russian oligarchs directly to assets is proving very difficult because they are all masters of using shell companies and relatives to hide their true ownership. Pour ceux qui souhaitent cacher leur argent, les territoires sous dépendance britannique, comme les îles Caïmans, les îles Jersey et les îles Vierges britanniques, sont des destinations de choix. 
Dans le passé, la Grande-Bretagne a prétendu que ses juridictions sont indépendantes et qu'elle ne peut pas dicter leurs lois. I listened to the Foreign Secretary correctly detail the importance of avoiding sanctions leakage and she was asked twice in this statement about British overseas territories. I detected a reluctance to go into detail on that. I've been very clear that we will absolutely be including overseas territories in all of these measures we're taking. Nous avons contacté le ministère des Affaires étrangères parce que nous voulions leur demander s'ils allaient prendre des mesures similaires à l'encontre des placements illicites issus d'autres pays. Le ministère des Affaires étrangères a refusé d'être interviewé dans le cadre de ce documentaire. Afin de l'aider à saisir les actifs russes, le Royaume-Uni a adopté la loi sur la criminalité économique, Economic Crime Act. Son objectif est d'aider les services de répression à identifier et à saisir les placements illicites au Royaume-Uni. The recent Economic Crime Act uh, basically passed into law that any trusts that are involved in the ownership uh, network of a property now have to um, declare the beneficial ownership to HMRC. However, that trust register is not public, so we're not entirely sure what information is even on it, whether that information is verified or how effective it is. Overseas trusts that own UK property will also have to register, well, under law will have to register there. I don't know how much that will be enforced. In, in practice, it's hard to say. It's not really clear um, how how exactly that's going to be implemented. Um, and, you know, so for example, if we look at um, the, the register of persons with significant control over UK companies, a lot of people complied with that. Uh, a lot of companies complied with that, um, but a lot didn't. They declared what appeared to be potentially nominees. Now, the UK government has promised to reform Companies House At the moment, Companies House is not empowered to check and verify the information that is submitted to it. It's quite possible to write down, uh, like I said, Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, uh, not the real beneficial owner, and no one's really going to check that information. So when we look at setting up something similar for the, for the property register, you know, we're likely to encounter the same kind of problems. How many of them are actually going to, to comply, and if they do, How do we know that that's the real, you know, the real beneficiary who owns that? How do we verify that? It's not hard to see why UK companies have become a vehicle of choice for corrupt actors, for money launderers to, to use to move and hide their wealth because the enforcement is weak. Nous avons voulu parler à l'ANC pour qu'elle nous dise comment elle envisage de s'attaquer au problème du blanchiment d'argent en Grande-Bretagne. L'ANC n'a pas souhaité nous parler. L'ANC fait partie du ministère de l'Intérieur. Nous souhaitions savoir si l'ANC avait la possibilité d'agir indépendamment du ministère auquel elle est rattachée ou si les poursuites qu'elle engage sont destinées à défendre les intérêts du gouvernement plutôt qu'à lutter contre la criminalité en tant que telle. En février 2022, le journal The Guardian a rapporté que l'ancien ministre conservateur Lord Fox, qui a tenté d'introduire un registre public des propriétaires de biens immobiliers à l'étranger en 2017 et en 2018, a été saisi par des fonctionnaires de quatre ministères qui lui ont demandé d'abandonner ce registre. Lord Fox a déclaré au journal qu'il est vraiment paradoxal que notre réputation en matière de respect de l'état de droit attire des personnes qui ont elles-mêmes très peu de considération pour l'état de droit et qui viennent de pays qu'il ignore presque totalement. Nous avons contacté le GAFI, l'ANC, le ministère des Affaires étrangères, le député John Glenn, le secrétaire d'État au Trésor et la députée Priti Patel en charge du ministère de l'Intérieur. Aucune de ces personnes ou organisations n'a accepté de participer à ce documentaire. Mais lorsque nous avons contacté Imran Khan, le premier ministre pakistanais de l'époque, il a accepté d'être interviewé. Yes, it's, a doc it's a documentary uh, about uh, individuals who have become very wealthy by being at, at the centre of power and uh, currently have a lot of wealth in London, especially in poverty. Corruption is, is not just uh, an issue for Pakistan. 
it is an issue for all the poor countries. In fact, I've come to this conclusion that countries are poor only because of corruption and corruption of the elite. It's the corruption of the powerful that destroys a country, not the corruption of the weak. When I, as a prime minister, if I want to make money out of, from my country, steal money and then send it abroad, I can only do it if I weaken the, the state institutions that would check my corruption. So the institutions get corrupt and they get weaker and they cannot stand in front of the powerful. The richer countries must come forward and treat money taken out of poor countries, money laundered out of poor countries the same way as terror financing and as drug money. Because the, these two terror financing and drug money affect the richer countries, the laws are very strict. But there's hardly uh, you know, any attempt to stop this plunder of the poor countries. I feel that there is no incentive for rich countries to uh, repatriate money or take action against these people because they benefit from them. There are countries that are benefiting from money stolen from our countries and which are parked there. They are benefiting from billions of dollars which flow into their properties and their businesses stolen from this country. So what incentive would they have? We are the ones who suffer and this is the dilemma. We don't have the resources to get the money back and they don't have any incentive to send it back to us. So this is the big problem which the entire developing world is facing. I guess uh, it's a question of now hiring more expensive lawyers abroad. Uh, but you see, when you look at the, the laws, they basically favor, I mean, the, I'm talking about the richer countries uh, as a whole, they tend to favor the crooks. It is so complicated to get your money back. Imran Khan has raised this issue in almost every forum that the rich countries must take care of uh, poor countries. And the care involves that the looted money that, was, uh, that is now invested in the rich countries must be returned to the original countries. In Panama Papers, the, the properties of Sharifs um, are categorically mentioned and all these properties are in the heart of London. And uh, everyone, including the British government, knows that these properties are actually bought from uh, laundered money. I think uh, international politics play a big role here. So some countries, you know, they say that what is ours is ours and what is yours is also ours. So this is the case with British government right now the United Kingdom, that the United States increasingly, that various other territories in the West are, are not only um, refusing to dismantle um, or make more open and accountable these kinds of systems, but are actively supporting territories that, that allow for the, the, the inflow of illicit financial wealth. And the world needs to be able to wake up to something like this. They'll, be, they'll shout about the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musks and, and, and Apples and all sorts of things, but they are eerily silent about the wealth that's being taken out and invested because it helps their countries. That's not right. We become victims twice, where when we are asking for our wealth to be returned, it becomes so difficult for us to have that happen. The Congolese still don't have the wealth from uh, Mobutu Sese Seko's reign returned. The Nigerians still don't have wealth from uh, Sani Abacha and many other people returned. Um, I'd say the same probably of the Dos Santos uh, regime. Countries that actively build these systems, actively finance these systems and protect them, don't do enough to be able to make them more open and accountable. That's just not right. Les révélations sur les placements offshore ont mis en évidence maintes et maintes fois que les personnes politiquement exposées ont recours à des juridictions secrètes pour dissimuler et blanchir leur argent, pour ensuite le réinvestir dans l'économie mondialisée. 
une grande partie du système financier international et un grand nombre de juridictions secrètes sont contrôlées et régulées par des intérêts occidentaux. Imran Khan a souvent dénoncé le blanchiment d'argent et les centres financiers offshore. Son gouvernement a interpellé les institutions et les gouvernements occidentaux afin qu'ils restituent les avoirs indûment acquis en provenance du Pakistan. Il a fait preuve d'indépendance en refusant l'implantation de la CIA sur le sol pakistanais, ce qui a provoqué la colère des États-Unis. Le 7 mars 2022, l'ambassadeur pakistanais aux États-Unis a indiqué dans un communiqué classé secret que Donald Lou, au fonctionnaire du département d'État, l'avait informé que les relations pakistano-américaines ne pourraient s'améliorer qu'à la condition qu'Imran Khan soit écarté du pouvoir. Khan actually accused the US of being behind a conspiracy uh, to get him ousted from power. The Prime Minister of Pakistan accused the US of uh, working with the opposition to remove him from power. There is absolutely no truth to that allegation. We are not going to let uh, propaganda, misinformation and disinformation, lies, uh, get in the way uh, of any bilateral relationship we have, including with uh, the uh, bilateral relationship we have with Pakistan. Prime Minister Imran Khan has been ousted from power. Lawmakers elected the opposition leader Shabazz Sharif as the country's new prime minister. A new dawn has started. A new day is coming. Allah has answered the prayers of millions. Quand Shabazz Sharif, le frère de Nawaz Sharif, a été nommé premier ministre le lundi 11 avril, le journal The Guardian a écrit :« Il est connu pour être un administrateur appliqué. » avec un grand amour de la poésie, si bien qu'il fait souvent l'ouverture de rencontres officielles avec les récitals de célèbres poètes révolutionnaires ourdou. Ses premiers mots devant le Parlement ont été « Chacun doit se libérer de toutes les limites de ses désirs ». Imran Khan prétend avoir été évincé par un complot soutenu par une puissance étrangère. « The US Embassy was calling members of, of my party, backbenchers who were not happy, and they were the first ones who then jumped ship and they were the ones who then offered a million dollars each to buy my other members of parliament who actually jumped ship later on and then Donald Lou's right. conversation with Let our me. ambassador the next day the no confidence motion is fine uh, is stable in the assembly you have what you, do you think you have I, made some you have made some significant allegations there when it's not allegations we have hard evidence. evidence why would i want to blame the us if I did not have hard evidence. This was an official message with no takers given to our ambassador, message received by me, by our president, given to the Chief Justice of Pakistan. This is real. Not only was a democratically elected government removed through the conspiracy, we have been replaced by a bunch of criminals. 60% of the cabinet which is sitting right now is on bail. The Prime Minister was about to be sentenced in a corruption cases of billions of rupees and his son. The Sharif doctrine is that you buy different people in all the important positions of power, whether it's in the media, you have your sympathetic journalists uh, who continue to argue for you uh, that uh, the country can only be saved by the wisdom of the Sharif family. The generals, once they retire, they are also accommodated. The judges, once they are retired, they are also accommodated. The journalists, they are also given a government position and they willingly take it. So it's the entire Sharif doctrine which uh, gives them the sense that uh, they can even get away with murder in Pakistan. Nawaz Sharif has learned that even though if you are out of power, if you manage to gain time and if you manage to delay the cases in the courts of law and once you come back into power, you can manage to get a clean check. So I think this time also the same strategy is being uh, followed by the Sharif family. I think uh, those in power, they think that they can get away with the crimes uh, they have done. And Sharif family has been benefiting from them uh, because of their international friends who have been coming to their rescue to strike the dirty deals. Quelqu'un a dit que pour accumuler des richesses au-delà des rêves les plus fous, il faut être proche de ceux qui produisent les lois et de ceux qui les font appliquer. Quand la coalition de Shabazz Sharif a été nommée, 
Une de leurs premières mesures a été de faire voter un amendement limitant le pouvoir du Bureau national des comptes publics en charge d'enquêter sur les criminels en col blanc au sein des institutions publiques. Cet amendement, voté en juin 2022, a pu être appliqué rétrospectivement. L'amendement stipulait que les tribunaux devaient décider de l'issue d'une affaire dans un délai d'un an et que si des preuves suffisantes n'étaient pas fournies au moment de l'arrestation, l'agent ayant procédé à l'arrestation risquait 5 ans d'emprisonnement pour fausse déclaration. Mohamed Rizwan, l'enquêteur en chef âgé de 47 ans, en charge de l'enquête à l'encontre de Shabazz Sharif et de sa famille dans l'affaire de Ramzan Sugar Mills, est mort d'une crise cardiaque le 9 mai 2022. Un autre enquêteur sur la même affaire a également été victime d'une crise cardiaque et se trouve encore aujourd'hui dans un état critique. Malik Maksoud, dont les comptes auraient permis de blanchir 3,7 milliards de roupies pakistanaises au profit de plusieurs membres de la famille Sharif, a coopéré avec les enquêteurs. Lorsqu'il a lui aussi été victime d'une crise cardiaque, il est décédé le 7 juin 2022. L'homme de 49 ans servait le thé à Ramzan Sugar Mills, où il percevait un salaire d'environ 300 dollars par an pour cet emploi dans l'entreprise familiale de la famille Sharif. Selon l'étude concernant ses richesses détenues, Londres se situe en tête devant son même New York. Londres est le terrain de jeu favori des oligarques du monde entier et des membres de leur famille. La famille Sharif du Pakistan, les Aliyev d'Azerbaïdjan, les Kenyatta du Kenya et bien d'autres familles liées à la politique, au passé ou au présent, ont acquis des fortunes considérables, très au-delà de leur source de revenus officiels, et possèdent un patrimoine foncier à Londres s'élevant à des milliards de livres sterling. Londres se vante d'être le lieu de la plus grande diversité en termes d'investissement immobilier, avec des propriétaires provenant de 45 pays différents. Les juridictions sous contrôle britannique continuent d'offrir des services pour des placements secrets et de l'évasion fiscale. 84 000 biens immobiliers au Royaume-Uni sont détenus de manière anonyme. Le gouvernement britannique a promis à plusieurs reprises de lutter plus fermement contre l'argent sale. Mais à chaque fois, le gouvernement n'a pas mis en œuvre la législation promise ou l'a tellement atténuée qu'elle en est rendue ineffective. La Grande-Bretagne reste la capitale du tourisme de procès en diffamation où les riches viennent tenter de faire taire leurs détracteurs. Londres reste un havre de paix pour les élites mondiales tombées en disgrâce dans leur pays d'origine. Le Pakistan, lorsqu'Imran Khan était au pouvoir, a essayé pendant de nombreuses années de récupérer l'argent blanchi. Beaucoup d'autres pays en développement ont fait de même, sans succès. Pour réaliser ce documentaire, nous avons contacté de nombreuses institutions gouvernementales. Personne n'a accepté de nous répondre. Le GAFI, l'organisme intergouvernemental de surveillance du blanchiment d'argent et du financement du terrorisme dont le siège est à Paris, a indiqué dans ses premiers rapports après l'éviction d'Imran Khan que le Pakistan a respecté toutes les recommandations, ce qui lui permet de ne plus figurer sur la liste grise du GAFI.